All right, well, yeah, my pleasure to introduce Xi Wang. He was our former PhD student. Uh, he actually got us into formal verification to begin with, so very happy. He's now at UW uh, doing a very uh, different style of formal verification in some ways, uh, so he'll tell us about that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I want to just, you know, thanks for having me here. I want to show you, you know, maybe, you know, 10 years after you graduate, you'll still be back here, so, <laughs> which is great. Uh, so today I'm just going to talk about the uh, sort of probably slightly different uh, style of uh, verification uh, with especially, you know, very like a mostly automated verification. Uh, I think we have seen a lot of interactive and also using Daphne style uh, uh, sort of like you know, some people call that autoactive uh, verification, and this is you know if, if we want to push uh, automation uh, to the extreme, uh, what kind of systems can we uh, build? Uh, so the sort of the uh, key sort of like the, the aspect or the kind of systems we're going to talk about it will be those like low level systems, uh, and our goal is simple. You know, we want to kill bugs. Uh, we we don't want to have those bugs uh, in our systems. So you know the first question is what what kind of bugs. Um, and you know, roughly speaking, you can imagine there are two, three types. Uh, one is you know because we're programming low-level uh, C code or assembly code, you will have low-level bugs like buffer overflows, division by zero. Um, and once you get those out of the way, then there could be some logical bugs. Like you have something in mind that is correct, but your implementation is wrong. Uh, maybe you missed some, you know, sanity checks, or maybe you didn't write the right checks at every single path in the right form, and, and your implementation does something different uh, from your design. And also, you know, the worst kind might be those kind of design bugs, like the design you had in mind was just wrong. So, for example, you wanted to, uh, you know, design OS kernel for isolation but your system called interface design was flawed. And then actually there's a way for uh, processes to leak data. Uh, so those are kind of you know, bugs uh, we're thinking about and we wanted to get rid of. And those bugs are oftentimes very uh, hard to uh, uh, eliminate and to show you how sort of uh, you know, tricky <laughs> or subtle the problem is. So if you remember, I think Nikolai gave a, a lecture on, on undefined behavior, I think during concert. Uh, and this is actually one of the examples that got us into verification in the first place. Uh, so this is uh, uh, some code snippet uh, we received, uh, I believe, from an Intel engineer. Um, he didn't tell us what the code was 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 doing, but you know, looks like some you know probably taken from a CPU emulator. And you can see what it does is you know it computes a, a sort of multiplication of two unsigned 64, uh, 16 bit integers A and B. And, you know, the code is really simple, you know, does a multiplication, assign the result to C, which is unsigned 32 bit. Then you return the result C and the functions uh, signature is actually having a, a 64 bit unsigned integer in the end. So that's like all uh, the code. And if you say, oh, here's a bug in the code, <laughs> can you spot it? Uh, if you stare at it uh, for a while, you know, you, the code looks fine. Um, but if you think, you, you know, it, this is over Zoom, so it's harder for me to do a demo, but you can actually uh, try to play with this using GCC on uh, Linux yourself. Uh, try to invoke the function with, say, 60,000 and 60,000, then you try to compute the product and what the result will you get, right? Um, and the Funny thing is actually not about the code itself, it's always wrong. The, the problem is uh, when you compile this C program using no optimization, like if you do GCC dash O zero, you will get A. Uh, but if you actually compile it using GCC dash O two, uh, which is you know the standard optimization you are you're uh, enabling for production code, you actually will get the result B. And, and that's actually the sort of like the, the, the sort of crazy part of this. Uh, if you look at the code, the code looks you know, innocent. Uh, but if you really you know, you know, look into the details, uh, what, what happens here is a very tricky sort of like a combination of rules. One is called C language's integer promotion rule, which is saying if you have a small integer, uh, then actually the C standard says the, you should be, that integer will be promoted to signed int. So here, both A and B will be promoted to actually signed int. 
And a second rule in the C standard saying signed integer overflow is undefined. So the C compiler could just, you know, they can just feel free to do kind of optimizations uh, based on this assumption that your code should not trigger undefined behavior. So in this particular case, uh, if you try this on TCC under O2, uh, the compiler actually will just keep a signed extension instruction in the end and you will get B. If you're using other compilers or other optimization levels, it actually just happens to be a zero extension and you'll get the expected result, which is A. Uh, but conceptually, you can get any result because it's not undefined. Uh, so this is actually a sort of interesting case for us because you know I, at that point I spent quite some time uh, looking at undefined behavior and it still took me a day to actually understand what exactly was going. Uh, but you know, basically you have to, the way to look at it is you, you dump all the results from the hundreds of TCC passes and see which pass did what. Um, and the question or one sort of lesson or, or conclusion we got out of this was if we couldn't get this like Y niner basically uh, correct, uh, then it's much harder to say build a you know correct software for larger uh, systems. And so one option where we started to look into is uh, what about formal verification? Uh, because formal verification could give us very strong correctness uh, guarantees. Uh, and in, throughout this uh, course, you have seen uh, many such examples, you know, such as FSEQ or Iron Fleet or Certicas Komodo, as you have seen. Um, one particular sort of like cost or premium you need to pay, of course, for formal for verification is proofs. Uh, if you, know, you have done your labs, you have seen those manual proofs, uh, oftentimes they are you know, much, much larger than your implementation and your specification. Um, and you know, one example is if you look at the Certicas, the version of Certicas, I think we saw a few weeks ago. Um, the OS kernel has like three, four, you know, system calls. You know, it's a fairly small OS kernel compared to the OSs we're using like daily. Uh, but the proof is actually over uh, 200k uh, lines of proofs and took multiple person years and oftentimes a, a PhD or multiple PhDs uh, to finish. So. The line of work we are looking at uh, exploring at U Washington is to say, what if we, you know, take proof automation at the starting point, you know, as a first class concern, we wanted to do sort of like a almost sort of fully automated, sort of like a, we sometimes call it push button style verification. And we have this magic box, we say, oh, here's a, some some you know automated verifier that will just decide whether our, our system is correct or not uh, and we are willing to take some hit so you know we are willing to restrict our implementations in some way we are willing to restrict the specification the kind of properties we can prove in some way and what can we build uh, so we actually started out with the uh, project called uh, Drisil. Uh, you can imagine that as a version of, uh, of uh, FSEQ and uh, close to the file system uh, or the lab you're do, you guys are doing. Uh, and let's see what we can we you know redesign the system in a way that we could automatically verify them. Uh, and we did some uh, small OS kernel called Hyperkernel, and it's a sort of like a simplified version of uh, if you took six eight two eight. Um, that's like uh, sort of like a you know. A, a, redesign of xv6 for uh, verification uh, and also we extended for some uh, non-interference so information flow control policies called nickel um, so this uh, in this lecture i'll mostly talk about how we uh, like what kind of what how the uh, this kind of process uh, works and what what are those restrictions so to sort of reiterate what i just said uh, so the goal we have is we will take the spec, you will write some you know, specification about you know, what your system should be doing. You will have some implementation uh, in C or in assembly or in some you know, machine instructions. Uh, and there's some magic box called automated uh, verifier that will take those as input and you know, act as a, as a compiler that translating those things into a set of uh, constraints. And then it will send those constraints to the uh, SMT solver to decide whether you know they are uh, valid or not. 
Uh, and you know we have used SM, we have seen you know work using SME servers uh, before, but in this particular uh, the case where, where we care about you know we want no proofs on implementation code. Like you will write a specification or environments, but no proofs. And in that way, actually, the, the main uh, restrictions we're introducing here one is now we call it the implementation will be finite, uh, which means the implementation cannot have you know, unbound loops. Uh, so, so the verifier can actually encode the entire program or implementation code uh, into constraints. And also we restrict the kind of constraints you're sending to the server. So, and also the kind of specification you can write such that they can actually even be encoded uh, by SMT. Um, and we'll see actually how, uh, give, I will give concrete examples later um, in this uh, lecture. Um, and of course, you know, this is naturally comes to the, like sort of a few questions, like you know, what's the consequence or implication of this? Uh, the first one is, you know, that magic box, the automated uh, verifier, like how, how do we write one? Uh, and the second one is uh, if you have tried those like automated verifier, oftentimes uh, because they do a lot of proof search, um, they do very complex reasoning. They sometimes just, you know, go just run away and they never come back. Uh, they're very slow, they may time out, they you know, exhaust their memory. And once you hit those kind of performance uh, bottlenecks, uh, how do you locate you know, what went wrong? How do you change your, you know, either implementation or your spec in a way that the verification can actually finish? And of course, the last one is because this kind of uh, verification puts uh, restrictions on your spec and implementation. So how do you, you know, retrofit? How do you modify your existing systems in a way that you can actually uh, verify them automatically? So that's a main question. Uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, in this lecture. Um, so any questions so far? Because I'm in full screen mode, so sometimes I cannot see questions in chat. Good, okay. So I'll talk about, so this is actually the verification stack, uh, one sort of instance of the verification stack we have. And this is actually roughly the, the key things that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, at the very bottom, that's the a main tool we're right, using called the Rosette. Uh, it's developed by Amina Torlak, also a faculty member at U Washington. And so Rosette is a language for creating verification and synthesis tools. So we use Rosette to create uh, verification tools such as Servo, uh, which is a framework for you know, uh, verifying low level systems code like uh, risk driving instructions or LLVM IR compiled from C code. And the last one is you can build tools on top of Servo. Uh, I think the paper you, you, uh, you have read uh, is about using Servo to verify uh, security monitors. Uh, one of our latest work is to uh, is, is building a um, tool called Jitterbug um, for building and verifying JIT compilers for a language called PPF used by the Linux kernel. Uh, so, I'll, so my uh, main uh, sort of the focus will be about Rosette, a brief summary about Rosette, and, and, and we'll talk about Servo in details. Uh, I'll just briefly describe the results from Jitterbug, uh, but I will not talk about how Jitterbug works uh, today. But feel free to check out our papers. Okay, so uh, the rest of the slides are uh, still from uh, Amina uh, on, on Rosette. Uh, so this is a quick sort of tutorial on Rosette. So feel free to uh, ask questions, uh, and I'll try my best to to, to answer you uh, from my understanding and my, my experience with uh, Rosette. Um, so basically, if you think about, um, you know, without verification, like if we don't do verification, uh, then what we do is we just write a lot of tests, right? We write some code, we have some specification in mind, we will write many, many tests. It could be unit tests, could be more integrated tests. And you want to check uh, your code is behaving as expected on um, you know specific inputs, for example, two. If you want to have input two, you want to show your program you know behaves uh, safely or correctly on two. So that's normally what we do in classic programming. Uh, what's different here uh, is uh, so some folks call it a symbolic tools, some folks call it as solver aided tools. Uh, is now you can actually represent uh, the input not as a concrete input, but as a symbolic value. For example, if you have a symbolic integer, 
uh, that means you know the, the integer like it's an x and x can be actually arbitrary uh, take arbitrary value and you can execute the program uh, with the symbolic value uh, and then you can do all kinds of reasoning uh, so for example you can query uh, you can tell me you know if i'm having a uh, symbolic input x and then one query you can issue is uh, can you find me an input x such that the, the assertion the safe uh, predicate will be violated uh, given this program uh, so that's and, and if you cannot find anything if the, um, uh, the the entire tool the entire stack tells you um, nothing uh, all input um, safe is maintained then that's verification uh, you have verified under all possible input that your program works. Uh, a more advanced use is actually you can, you know, if you have you have a stack that can tell you automatically whether an input works or not, and also it can give you a counterexample or like a violation when something doesn't work. Here's an input that will trigger a violation. Uh, you can use that to build something called uh, program synthesis. So you can actually, for example, have holes in your program. Like here, for example, I, I just don't want to write my some part of my program. And you can do a different kind of query uh, and actually use this to derive to uh, basically auto-complete your program such that you know, for all input, this uh, program will, the implementation will satisfy uh, your given spec. Uh, so we're not going to talk too much about program synthesis uh, we you know mostly will focus on verification uh, but synthesis is something fun to try especially uh, for some like we actually used it for example in the JIT compilers we're verifying for part of it we use it for uh, some super optimization uh, but no matter what you do uh, all of those kind of like formal tools or symbolic tools have a sort of like key component here uh, which is a symbolic compiler that takes your program and uh, encode the program into constraints. So, you know, you can send them to your SMT server. And the question is, how do you write one? And that's actually a really hard uh, uh, task. Uh, so before I think I mentioned a few projects uh, before like Yggdrasil or Hyperkernel there, we actually wrote that part ourselves uh, manually from scratch. Uh, we used um, this Python library for day three uh, SMT server, and we you know basically build a uh, sort of like symbolic compiler from uh, LLVM IR to uh, SMT constraints, and, and it's just a very hard task because it requires you to think about uh, both the semantics of the input language and also the symbolic constraints you are generating. Uh, so it takes some oftentimes you know years to to build a mature tool, um, and the sort of like the, uh, the, the nice part or the very attractive part of uh, Rosette is actually it provides a sort of a new programming model for creating those tools. So you don't have to actually create from scratch. What you need to do is to write an interpreter for the source language, such as LVMIR or um, RISC-V instruction set. And Rosette itself, you know, basically behaves as a kind of like a symbolic virtual machine that will lift your interpreter into a verifier. Like, so you can use it to uh, encode symbolic programs. Uh, so the hard part, of course, is how do you encode that in a efficient way? So you want, you know, good constraints. Uh, and, and remember this one, during this encoding, you are running an interpreter plus a program uh, on top of the interpreter. So there's like a sort of like an indirection there that is hard to deal with. Um, so I'll talk about that actually in details in, in a few minutes, like how the encoding works. Uh, but this is a sort of like a powerful paradigm a change because before, you know, it takes months or years to build a tool, but now all you need is just write an interpreter. Uh, some people call that uh, also deep pre-embedding. Uh, another one uh, you can do also in Rosette is you instead of writing an interpreter, you could also write a library using the Rosette language, um, and then you can also do symbolic reasoning that way. And that's called uh, the terminology sometimes called a shallow embedding. Uh, but either way, you can actually use this to build a lot of tools. And, and actually, Rosette has been used uh, in a wide range of 
uh, applications. Uh, so one is education uh, you can use. So there's a startup using it to, you know, for example, you know, to create homeworks. Uh, you can, for example, if you do like you know algebra, uh, like K twelve uh, algebra education, you want to create problem saying, oh, you can only use uh, theorems or lemmas up to this point. Uh, and how do you uh, create new problems? And, and with this restricted set of theorems, students have been taught. Or if you get an assignment, how do you, how do you grade them? How do you explain to people why their solution was wrong? Um, you can also use this to build compilers. Uh, so one example is called Swizzle uh, Inventor. This is a, a, a compiler, uh, U Washington and NVIDIA uh, developed for GPU kernels. Uh, and of course, you know, I will talk about the applications in systems uh, software today, mostly in servo, but uh, also there are many examples and uh, one is uh, the one done by uh, Anish on uh, building a hardware wallet called uh, Notary. Uh, and also we uh, use it to build a some sort of like a verifying some you know, software in medical uh, settings lines of this uh, radiation therapy machine at U Washington uh, uh, Medical Center. Uh, basically when those uh, folks there wanting to upgrade their software, they want to verify, um, basically you want to, when you shoot uh, neutron beams to cure uh, cancer patients, you want to make sure when you put a human into the chair, uh, the software and hardware basically combined will make sure that chair is, is fixed, right? It's not rota rotating while you're shooting beams into uh, patients. And does the software or the end-to-end -end system guarantee that kind of properties? Uh, so uh, we actually used Rosette to, to verify a bunch of components in that uh, uh, stack. So there are many more. So feel free to, to check out the uh, website for the use. Uh, but you know, next I'll just give you some overview of how uh, Rosette works. So at the of, I think I mentioned, you know, there's one direction. So you have a program and you write an interpreter for that program and the Rosette will lift it to become a symbolic evaluator. Then the entire thing will be um, com basically compiling your program into uh, constraints and sent to a uh, SMT server. Uh, and also, once the server comes back with certain results and the result will parse the result and actually lift it up to your program as well. So you can have a program inspecting the results from the server as the data structure in your program. Uh, and the uh, cool part about this is now because you can program in the result language and the language is much higher level, uh, you can use all kinds of you know, things you like in a higher level program language. Um, whereas in the lowest level, um, it's uh, the primitives supported by the SMT solver, like uh, bit vectors, integer rails, algebra functions, uh, which you don't have to uh, deal with uh, when you create when you create tools uh, in Rosette. Uh, so let me give you a concrete example to to see how actually those like encoding uh, works. Uh, so this is, uh, so imagine uh, this, we're going to look at a, a function. Uh, the function does two things. It will sort of reverse a list uh, and it will also does some filtering. It will just remove those negative numbers and, and, and zeros and keep only positive numbers. So for example, if uh, you have an input of list three, one minus two, the out of, output of this program will be just one and, and, and three. So it will just reverse the entire thing and keep only the positive, the two positive ones. Uh, so here's the pseudo code uh, for the program. So you can see this is you know, pretty uh, input VS and PS, you just gradually you know, just loop over the input. And if uh, you have the uh, positive value of V, you just insert it to the result PS. So that's a very simple toy program. And imagine we want to verify or check uh, something like, okay, uh, the result, we just had a searching saying the length of, you know, the input output, the same thing, you know, which of course doesn't hold in, in general, but suppose we just want to uh, check for that, uh, giving symbolic uh, uh, input like A and B, they can be any like symbolic integers. And we want to translate this entire thing into constraints. 
a logical constraint. So what would you do? Like if you just write this manually, uh, what would you write? You know, by your understanding of the program, uh, what what what's your uh, Anyone has any thoughts? Right, so if you want to, um, you know, do this manually, and this is, you know, if you understand the program, right, uh, what you will do as a biohuman is uh, you will write, okay, both that it be should be positive. And that's how you would manually encode this entire program. And now the next is how do you actually write the program? to do the encoding. Uh, so there are, in the literature, there are two sort of like a big sort of schemes of uh, encoding. Uh, one scheme is called a symbolic execution. Uh, one scheme is called a bounded model checking. And I will give you a sort of, like, you know, let's walk through and see actually how each uh, sort of paradigm will encode that particular program. Uh, so symbolic execution um, the, the high level, the big idea of simple execution is really just to explore every single path in your program and then summarize the result in the end. So basically, whenever you encounter a branch, uh, you just fork, you just clone the world, uh, you try two branches, assuming the you know condition holds and assuming it's true and assuming it's false, and then you just keep going. And just keep going, keep going, and assuming uh, your program has no unbounded um, loops, in the end, uh, everything will, you can just join everyone, everything, every country you, you get in the end. So that's a high level idea of uh, symbolic execution. Uh, so we can see how it works here. So, for example, uh, initially the input VS is just two symbolic integers A and B. Uh, and then you go into the loop and you, you know, see the first. Uh, uh, branch, uh, then that's testing if A is positive or not. So you will take basically both ways. Suppose we take the way saying A is positive, uh, then we'll get PS uh, being, you know, having one element, and then we, you know, go to the second iteration of the loop. Um, and you will see, uh, let's see, this time we just assume B is, is you know, non-positive, then you go to that branch. And then in the end, you will summarize, you will get this constraint A is, uh, the path condition will be A is positive and B is non-positive and the assertion is false. So that's you know one branch, uh, one path throughout the branches. And of course you can repeat uh, the entire process for every single branch and then you will get the final encoding at the very bottom. Uh, so you can see, you know, three cases will be false and the only uh, case of the true will be you know both a and b are positive so that's symbolic execution basically by you know exploring every single path and forking at every single branch and point okay a different approach uh, is called a bounded mode checking that's a different uh, scheme for encoding uh, a program into constraints uh, the high level idea is you can imagine you're just gradually expanding in your program one step at a time, but every time after one step, you just merge the result. So in some way, it's like you're inserting a, a temporary uh, variable right away after every um, uh, step. So for example, if you look at the first one, if you know A is zero or not, then you, uh, you create a symbolic uh, value for that, and then you do insertion. And after that, you do the insertion. So every time you do the, repeat the same thing. So that's, you can look at the uh, constraints on the right, and that's encoding for um, bounded model checking. Um, so the trade-off, of course, of the two branches, uh, the, 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 the two schemes is, if you do bounded model checking, uh, the encoding size is a polynomial, uh, which is good. Uh, you don't have to explore uh, the exponential number of uh, path. Uh, the downside is that the constraints are like really symbolic. Uh, so you will have to have the solver to do a lot of reasoning because you're not taking advantage of any sort of concrete values. Um, as a comparison, you can see in symbolic execution, it's the other sort of like an extreme. Uh, you will have to explore a lot of, uh, a large number of paths uh, 
but the final encoding is oftentimes nice uh, it, it's because you, you take advantage of the concrete values in your program and in the end you you will have like a, sort of like sometimes oftentimes you know simpler encodings uh, and of course, the question is, can you have the sort of advantage from both worlds? Can you have polynomial encoding? And also you can take advantage of this uh, concrete evaluation to basically take the burden out of the solver as much as you can. And the answer is yes. And that's the building uh, strategy in uh, Rosette. Uh, I will not go into the details here, but the high level idea of that uh, so sort of like this hybrid uh, evaluation strategy in Rosette is to take advantage of type information. Uh, so it does some sort of like uh, very smart merging based on type information and the structure of your program. Um, and in that case, in the default model, for example, here, uh, the result is actually also the same as symbolic execution. You get a very nice um, uh, constraints, like just A, both A and B are positive. But also, the uh, you don't have to explore a dimensional number of, of paths. You still have a polynomial uh, sized encoding. So that's the sort of like a promising part of this. Uh, if you run Rosette by default, uh, you will get a very nice encoding. Um, but that's not the full story. The hard part of uh, this kind of encoding is that no strategy works on all programs. Uh, so even though the default one works most of the time, but sometimes it will just break down. Uh, and that depends on your, you know, what kind of domain you're working on, the program you're writing, and the semantics of the program you're, you're, you're writing as well. So one example here is just, you don't have to look into the boxes and what they do, but the rough ideas, if you remember the running example uh, from the servo paper, uh, this toy risk interpreter, uh, and if you just do it, uh, sort of like without any optimization, that way you will get a sort of like an evaluation uh, graph like the left one. So it's not too bad, but it's complex. Uh, but if you pl uh, apply this one nine change to, to optimize the symbolic evaluation process, you will get a much nicer uh, evaluation graph and actually a much smaller uh, constraint in the end. So the key sort of uh, knobs uh, Rosette provides here is uh, the default strategy is good enough, but also doesn't work all the time. So it provides knobs for you to tune, uh, to, to fine tune the symbolic evaluation strategy for your particular domain. So that's the uh, promise of this. Um, so basically you need two things. You need a way to look into the symbolic evaluation process and change uh, things on the fly. And also you want a way to tell you, you know, where to change, like what would be causing the problem. So basically um, those are the two uh, core techniques offered by Rosette. One is called uh, symbolic reflection, which is an API for you to you know, peek into symbolic uh, terms at uh, uh, constraints at uh, during symbolic evaluation and another one called symbolic profiling, which is a provider that you can use to you know tell where you know is where went wrong during symbolic evaluation, you know, which is a slow part or which part is generating giant constraints. Uh, and actually I'll show you a concrete example in a few minutes. Um, but that's all for the first part. Uh, of this uh, lecture, it's about uh, Rosette. So the uh, quick summary is the Rosette is a language for you to create uh, uh, verification and synthesis tools. Uh, it works by you know asking you to write an interpreter for the language you are uh, implementing, so such as LLVMIR, risk five instructions, etc. And Rosette will lift that into a sort of like a symbolic compiler that encodes your program into logic constraints. And it provides enough knobs for you to tune uh, your symbolic evaluation process to generate better constraints. So that's the uh, uh, quick summary of what Rosette does. Uh, so any questions so far? Very good. I have a question. Okay. So if you go back to the previous slide, this diagram is already a lot of progress towards understanding what's going on. Is this mm -hmm. automatically generated? 
No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is uh, generated by, by LaTeX and LaTeX source is written by human. Okay. <laughs> but but I think you, I don't know actually Rosetta has a. Um, I'm not sure if Rosetta has a tool to output the you know a graph directly, but but does have all the information you needed to produce this program, graph for sure. Yeah, I guess the thing that's concerning to me is uh, probably, I, I think you've hidden some things that are really large. Like, are there any ellipses in this or is this actually complete? So this one is actually complete for that program. Um, the, the, the basically the dotted lines are the things we are not showing in details. Um, I think if I remember correctly. Okay, okay. Uh, so they actually, like I mean, now uh, considered doing the uh, like showing like the graphs in the tools if I remember correctly uh, the problem with the graphs is uh, when you have any sort of like a you know real programs the graphs are not readable at all <laughs> they're just giant sort of like uh, graphs and it's hard to make any sense out of them uh, so the UI actually will see in, in, in the you know symbolic profiler is actually much uh, easier to read uh, I see. I see. Okay, so you sort of manually translated what yeah, this is the, really what the symbolic profile gave you into something that you could present. Right. More like a regular graph. profiler, uh, which we'll see actually in a few minutes. I see. I see. Okay. So next, uh, I'll just you know use Servo as example. Uh, let's see. Uh, so how do we use Rosetta to build uh, verifiers for uh, low-level systems code, and how you know we use symbolic. Uh, profiling and uh, reflection and you know, different things to optimize the pro process so you can generate better constraints. And um, so again, uh, this, this is just the stack we seen before, uh, just to, to refresh, um, basically our goal is you have a spec you write that's intended behavior of your system. Uh, you will have a implementation of your system. You know, let's say risk five instructions, uh, some binary image um, then you will have a magic box uh, called Grace 5 Verifier that is built on top of Servo. And you will take the instructions and, and you know, as and it behaves as a um, symbolic compiler that will translate those uh, sort of like program or instructions into uh, SMT constraints. And the entire thing, you know, as we have seen, will be lifted by Rosette. And then Rosette will talk to the SMP solver, send the constraints there, and get the results back, and then pass back the results. So that's the entire stack. And to make things concrete, let's see a very uh, simple, like a toy example. Uh, suppose the spec or the, the you want to uh, verify is a function called sign. Uh, this is a very uh, simple one. Uh, if x is negative, return. Uh, minus one, if X is positive, return one, and if X is zero, return zero. So that's a, a very simple spec for the sign function. Um, and suppose you have an implementation of that function in uh, risk five uh, assembly. So that will be the instructions on the right. Um, and the one thing I'm not showing here is a spec for refinement, uh, but that will be the same as you have seen over and over again throughout this course. Um, basically we want to show when you give the same input and you will observe the same output uh, for both the spec and the implementation. Uh, and our goal is you want to pass both uh, into servo and you get uh, verification, you know, success or not, if there's a bug. And the, you know, sort of like the, to, to make this work, you know, of course you need to write a verifier as like an interpreter for your risk five uh, instructions. Uh, and then if there's any sort of like, you can run the symbolic provider to see if there's any bottleneck. If there's nothing, you're good. I'm just run the entire thing, you're done. Once you write up the spec. Uh, if it doesn't work, uh, when you have hit some uh, verification performance bottlenecks, uh, then you want to find out where went wrong and apply uh, symbolic optimizations, uh, which fine tune the process and until you actually can get it done. So that's sort of like the big uh, sort of like a work workflow we want to uh, uh, go through. So let's uh, see. Actually, how, go ahead. Oh, actually, this slide might be answering a bit of it. Um, but I was just going to ask, like, do, does this, uh, I guess, like interpreter support just higher level architecture? Um, 
or does it also support like micro architecture? Like, can you have like a BTB uh, modeled in the interpreter or is it just like registers and stuff like that? Right, so uh, it depends on what we want to achieve. So here, uh, what we're doing here, so for example, we, we, we just want to verify the code, uh, sort of like the behavior function correctness of the code itself. So the level we are doing here is at the ISA level. Uh, so you can see the interpreter is really for the ISA, uh, at risk five ISA semantics. So it doesn't have any microarchitecture uh, state. Uh, if you want to do that, you totally can do it. So what, you know, for example, like a niche, uh, when, when they did, the uh, uh, notary project, they actually wrote it all the way down to the gate level, uh, like an interpreter for that in Rosette. Uh, so they were actually able to run the entire thing uh, with the you know, CPU or the hidden CPU state as well. Uh, so it, it depends on how you want to do it, like what you want to do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so let's look at the interpreting details. So this is a you know, tiny, sort of like a simplified RISC-5 uh, uh, interpreter. Uh, and this is sort of roughly like what you're gonna do uh, in C or in any language. Uh, you know, first is you, you write uh, your, you, know, you, you define your state of your uh, sort of like CPU, which will be the program counter PC and a bunch of uh, general purpose registers and could be more like a memory, et cetera. And then you will have a you know, core function interpret, uh, which will do basic instruction fetching and dispatching based on what opcode it has and then the semantics. So for example, you're gonna get the current PC uh, program counter, uh, fetch instruction based on the program and which instruction you are looking at. Then you match on the opcode. And if it's, uh, for example, LI, uh, load immediate uh, instruction, then you will just write the interpret to encode the semantics, right? You said you bump the PC by one, you set the red, uh, destination register to that immediate. So that's how you write interpreter. So this is really like a, you know, just regular programming. Uh, and the entire thing is actually also executable. Uh, so one, you know, because of this will be part of your TCB, right? you have to trust the semantics of your risk five uh, interpreter. So you can actually run this with uh, concrete. And we actually do this ourselves in this existing risk, risk five CPU test suite. You run through them to so make sure to improve the uh, sort of your confidence uh, in the correctness of your spec. So this is a, a first step. And the second step is, you know, suppose you have everything in place and you have an interpreter, uh, you have the spec of the sign function. And one thing, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't show is the refinement definition. Uh, with everything in place, just plug into servo and say go. Uh, and if it, you know, finishes and tells you, oh, everything works, then you're done. Uh, verification finished. Uh, you don't have to write more proofs on the uh, implementation code. Uh, but you know, normally that's not the case. Uh, if you have uh, any real programs, oftentimes uh, either you have bugs in your, spec, uh, your implementation you want to fix, maybe your spec is not right. Sometimes that's the case too. Uh, but also the more common case is when the verifier just dies. You know, it's very slow and takes hours or days to finish or just, it just runs away, it just never comes back. And then now that's a problem, you know, giving a automated verification stack, it's hard to know why. Uh, so the cool part of uh, using uh, Rosette uh, is it has a profiler for symbolic evaluation. So you can actually run it. Uh, so for the program I showed earlier, it's a very simple program, actually it won't trigger anything. But uh, so I actually added more <laughs> loops to, to the program or not loops, but more control flows in the program last night. Uh, and actually to cause it to, to basically uh, explode. Uh, and here is a result. If you run this uh, symbolic profiler, here's actually you can uh, observe uh, either offline or actually online during symbolic evaluation as well. So you can see clearly this entire thing just <laughs> exploded. Uh, you have like a, a, a deep stack of interpret. Um, and you can see, you know, it has some very large numbers with some stats numbers. Uh, you don't have to understand exactly what they're doing, but you can, uh, so the high idea of those is to give you some sense of um, basically doing some body evaluation, uh, what types of terms or internal structures are being created and which ones might be the problems. Uh, but the most useful thing I find myself is just look at the score. Uh, so uh, Rosette computes a score based on a basically heuristic function to tell you how bad 
page function is under symbolic uh, evaluation. Uh, so just to be clear, this is not about like, profiling a concrete input. This is about uh, sort of like profiling under a, a symbolic input. So this is really encoding all possible inputs. Um, and you can see uh, the, you know, the higher the score is, the worse that function is. So the worst one is of course interpret execute. You know, that's not surprising. That's a, a bunk of the interpreter. Um, but also it says, you know, two things are really bad. One is a vector set under the function set CPU reg. When you are setting the CPU, something is really, really slow. Another one is a vector ref, which is you know, basically inside the fetch function when you fetch the, uh, inst the current instruction at the program counter. Uh, that's also bad. So let's actually just, just go there because you know the provider tells us that particular you know, function looks you know all those look suspicious. We can just take a look at you know why uh, why this fetch uh, function is bad under symbolic evaluation. Uh, so. Remember what this one is doing is really just you know get the current program uh, counter and try to you know choose the instruction in your program at that particular location. Uh, so let's actually just walk through the program and see actually how it works. So the first instruction here is uh, uh, you know testing whether something is less than zero. That's a SLTZ instruction. Um, what Rosette does here is once you have an interpreter, and there are two cases, right? Whether the input uh, X is you know negative or not. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, Rosette's default uh, evaluation strategy is to first split, you know, consider it considers both cases, and it merges cases back uh, right after that. So what you're gonna get is the uh, box at the bottom. So you get the, the PC will be bumped by one. A0 is still symbolic, uh, uh, a symbolic input X, and A1 will be a sort of like a if else, if then else uh, expression, uh, a symbolic expression. Uh, so A1 is valid depending on whether input X is you know, negative or not. So that's the first one. So doing this, you know, avoids path exp uh, explosion because you don't have to you know, try every path to the very end, you can merge right back uh, after that instruction. So the second instruction here is uh, BNEZ is a conditional jump uh, based on whether the, the register is a zero or not. Um, and this is actually the tricky part. So if you do the same thing, uh, you can see the, the value in the PC uh, now becomes symbolic too, uh, because there are two cases, by default Rosette merges the state back and you get a symbolic PC. And the problem is once you try to do the next step, uh, because the PC now is symbolic, uh, of course, Rosette doesn't know what to do now. Uh, so a sound way is to just try every single path and every possible value of a PC uh, and, and then see what happens. So you can see this creates like a runaway effect in a PC because PC is a symbolic expression, which could be arbitrarily complex. Uh, whereas that just treats it as an opaque symbolic value and tries uh, conservative every possible uh, case. And then your constraints you know, gets bigger and bigger over time. So that's why. So you're getting a state explosion uh, due to a symbolic uh, program counter. So what you want to do next is now you know where things go wrong based on the input of a symbolic provider. Uh, you want to repair that. I want to fine tune the symbolic uh, evaluation process. Uh, and the way to do it is something we're introducing in servo is called symbolic optimization. Uh, you can imagine that as some sort of like a people uh, optimization based on uh, uh, over your symbolic state. You want to use some dummy knowledge to fine tune the process. Uh, so the change you have seen from the paper is really just one line change. Like you know the PC will become symbolic. So let's just split the PC to every possible uh, uh, concrete value to the very end. Uh, so there's a function from servo called split PC, which is exactly doing exactly that. It will basically peek into the structure of the PC if it's a, like, if like IT instruction will recursively look into it until the very leaf and extract the uh, concrete PC values with the path condition on it. 
and you run the rest of the uh, evaluation using that concrete value, then the entire process merges uh, the states back after that. So roughly it looks like this. So before, because you know, when PC becomes symbolic, you don't know what to do. Uh, and Rosette basically you know, generates that giant graph. And now if you insert that one line change, uh, now we actually get the concrete uh, PC back and then the uh, symbolic evaluation graph becomes much simpler and you get much better uh, constraints. So that's a rough idea of this symbolic optimization. Basically the, the, the domain knowledge we are exploring here is we want to split the PC to avoid state explosion, but we want to keep other registers still symbolic so we don't have to explore too many paths. So that's the sort of like the way you can use domain knowledge to find tune uh, symbolic evaluation process to get better constraints. Uh, any questions so far? All right. Uh, of course, you know, the program counter is just a very simple example. There are way more cases. I think you can see in the paper about, you know, how do you deal with memory addresses? Uh, how do you deal with very complex system registers and et cetera. All right. um, so this is a summary of this part. Uh, so to construct a verifier in servo, you can uh, so, you know, view this as write interpreter for the semantics of the language you are verifying. Uh, the programs you're written in, and also you just apply or try to you know, identify uh, per verification performance bottlenecks and apply symbolic optimizations until you get it done. Uh, the good thing about this is, you know, it's easy to test your verifier that is executable, just like a you know, regular CPU uh, emulator, uh, and also provides a systematic way for you to identify and to scale your, uh, uh, identify bottlenecks and scale your verification. Uh, and I want to uh, make it very clear here. One is this is about identifying bottlenecks during symbolic evaluation. So this solves or addresses two issues. One is the symbolic evaluation itself is too slow. And you can identify performance bottlenecks there. Uh, it can also, you know, sort of like indirectly trying to uh, you know, identify sort of expensive SMT constraints, like a giant constraints. If you see, you know, very complex constraints being generated, you can identify them as a pro proxy to, to say, oh, that might take a lot of time later during SMT solving. Uh, but it does not invoke the solver. So if you have very simple, it looks simple uh, SMT constraints, for example, you have something like a, a bit vector division. That's just a simple, but very expensive to solve by the SMT solver itself. Uh, symbolic profiling doesn't help you with that. So that requires some domain knowledge. Let's say you probably want to avoid those uh, in your program or in your spec. Uh, another one is doesn't tell you where to repair it. It tells you some things might be wrong here and there, and based on your knowledge, you can you know easily pinpoint or more oftentimes easily pinpoint where things go wrong. Uh, but how to repair that requires uh, expertise. Uh, and actually, one of our students worked on a, a tool called Simfix, uh, which will actually try to try a few. Uh, uh, possibilities and 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 with a sort of actually a set of like a sound transformations to try to fix that for you. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, you can check that uh, paper. Okay, so this is uh, so given this, uh, you can uh, so build them one more verifiers. We actually have built a bunch of them uh, ourselves. Uh, we built. Uh, you know, Risk five one and uh, Q six one ARM, uh, both uh, thirty two and sixty four bit, uh, one for L of M I R and one for the uh, Berkeley packet filter BPF one, uh, all on top of uh, Servo. So you can feel free to check them out in the uh, uh, on GitHub. Uh, so I will talk about two sort of use cases here. Uh, one is how do we retrofit some security monitors? Previously we have seen. Uh, verified uh, using uh, Cock or using Daphne, uh, and we retrofit them to automated verification uh, and basically use the. So what we did was we took the two, and which you have seen before in previous lectures. Uh, we ported both to RISC-V 
uh, and then we use the risk five verifier from servo on the binary image. Uh, we want to prove two things. We want to prove uh, functional correctness, uh, basically you know, refinement. And then we also want to prove some non-interference on, on the spec. Uh, the time actually spent is, is not too bad. It's roughly two, four weeks each. Uh, and also, you know, just to be clear, right? We, we, we're able to reuse a lot of effort people have spent. They you know, spend a lot of time dividing the spec and we were able to just reuse them uh, here. Uh, the main questions if you, or main things you want to go through doing a, for a retrofitting is really, uh, is the implementation free of unbounded loops? Uh, so you want, if the implementation has unbounded loops, you might want to rewrite your implementation, remove them or rewrite them somehow. Uh, and another question you need to do during retrofitting is you want to ask, is the spec expressible in, in servo? Uh, because you know we want to do automated reasoning, you can only use a, a restricted subset of first order logic. So if you have like an infinite uh, unbounded number of traces, uh, you need to break them down uh, in a way that you can actually express uh, the properties you care about. Or maybe you need a different tool for your job. Uh, so let me uh, talk about one example. Uh, this is a circuit cost, I think the example we saw uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the, th this particular version uh, basically provides a very strict isolation. Uh, it partition, uh, statically partitions memory and uh, uh, PIDs uh, among processes. And the key thing they aim to achieve is a non-interference. So basically, each process would behave as if it's the only process in the system uh, and other processes cannot affect its behavior or you know, uh, infer what it's doing. Uh, so if you look at the implementation, uh, there are I think three-ish uh, system calls in that uh, uh, OS kernel. Uh, they're all free of, already free of unbounded loops. So you actually don't have to do anything there to change the uh, interface or implementation. Uh, we did change a little bit because mostly because of the uh, porting, like we ported to uh, from X6 to uh, RISC-5. So, uh, but the interface is largely the same. Um, but the spec uh, is, uh, you know, is not expressive uh, in servo directly. Uh, if you still remember uh, from Nikolai's lecture on, on Certicos, uh, the top level one is talking about a per process view. Uh, like, when, like I'm, suppose I'm a process and I do a, you know, a, a number of transitions to maybe I'll yield to another process and another process might do a bunch of things. And eventually the entire thing will, you know, the OS kernel will yield back to myself. So that's actually a trace of, uh, you know, possibly unbounded number of events. Uh, that's hard to express uh, in SMT directly. So what uh, they did and the certicast paper did is they actually proved three lemmas uh, and each lemma is about a single action, like a single system call, like a yield or a single Cisco. Um, and each action is actually finite. It's actually simple enough to express. So they proved in COC that you know, if you have those three individual uh, lemmas, then together they, they imply uh, the non-interference theorem they have. So what you can do here is, uh, what we did here is to prove those three lemmas in uh, certain cost using a uh, server. So of course, you know, the reasoning about whether actually when they combine together to imply non-interference is left in, in, in cock. So this is a sort of like a summary of uh, this uh, sort of the ritual fitting part. Uh, the security monitors, uh, you know, are actually interesting, good, uh, like a sort of like an application of good fit for automated verification because they do something very simple and they check for simple properties. So naturally they already own, oftentimes free of unbounded loops and they don't use very complex data structures. Um, so they are actually pretty good for <laughs> automated verification. Uh, the question I think uh, we left, I think for, for you is, you know, can you change it in a way? Like, can you try to see what kind of uh, operations that are, are actually not finite uh, and it will require some work. Uh, so one example is, can you add something to uh, Komodo or to Certicast? Uh, and you know, that operation is not finite. And how would you, uh, 
uh, finalize it? How do you break it down to smaller things uh, that won't do many operations? Uh, and also, you know, what if you want to do even more other properties like you know, crash safety, as you have seen in FSEQ, or compiler correctness in uh, CompShoot? Uh, what would you do? So, uh, Nicola, can we do, a, do we need to do a breakout or? <laughs> can we yeah, up to you. I think uh, like we don't have a we don't have a huge number of students, uh, so we could do breakouts. Mm -hmm. We could uh, sort of just ch chat in here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, can I actually see the list here because I lose my cursor? Yeah, so I think we have uh, like uh, Alex, uh, Christian, and Eileen are like the three students here. Others mm -hmm. will, I guess, watch on YouTube. Uh, so maybe let's just uh, discuss here. So, um, so what do you guys think? Uh, maybe anyone want to volunteer or? big names alex <laughs> sure uh so i guess uh i mean it it sounds like very uh, uh, i, I might, might have missed the question but are you just asking like generally what we think about the summary or sorry oh so what, what did you write in the uh the question the paper question oh uh yeah so do you mean like the like the response to the paper question or yeah. the question we like, have. like what what kind of like a non-finite operations did you uh, imagine oh, or like yeah yeah so i think um i wasn't really sure if this was right um but i think komodo uh the specification for um getting like a new process id uh for like spawning a thread it didn't seem to suggest that it like guaranteed to terminate um so that because like it just said that like it returns the lowest PID not currently in use, but there might be no PID that's not currently in use. So it could just spin for forever. Um, so that was an example, but I wasn't really sure if if that was a valid example or not. So you mean the certain cost one, right? Not Komodo. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I might. I, I think I'm mixing those up. Yeah, sorry. So, so if I understand correctly, so come on, oh, sorry, <laughs> so because, uh, uh, is uh, spawning, when you're doing spawn, you're gonna return the, I think in that paper is lowest uh, unused uh, PIDs. Uh, right, when yeah. Already used up, it just fails. So that's still finite, right? Nothing requires a infinite loop. Okay, I wasn't sure, like the specification didn't seem to suggest like it didn't talk about what would happen if there wasn't one available. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought that it was possible that it could just spin until one was available. Um, which ah, could be right. Um, right. I mean, in general, that's actually, you know, for like, you know, something like a news kernel, actually, that's, a, you know, like you have blocking uh, system calls, right? You wait until some resources uh, become uh, available. That that actually is, is uh, makes sense. Uh, in certain calls, probably doesn't. Uh, specifically because either they wanted to have some non-interference. Uh, so they probably don't want that kind of interference between uh, uh, processes. But yes, you're right. If you have any blocking uh, kind of cause, uh, this will be an issue. Yes, you're right. And and do, do, what did you say about the uh, change, a possible change you could uh, do there? I mean, so... Uh, uh unfortunately i just I, I kind of put the change of just like having it have like an error code that it could return like uh if i don't know like make zero an error code or something or negative one an error code or something like that um just like make it like return something if there's nothing available um so that it never is unbounded yeah so actually that's a, a very good change right basically if you have a blocking so it's called that is waiting on some resource you could just you know just you know, change it to be like a more like asynchronous uh, style. Just say, if you want to loop loop, loop in your space, uh, try again later. I'll I'll just return error code right now. Yeah. yeah. Um. What about others? <laughs> what did you uh imagine? Uh, Christian or Eileen? I don't know. Either yeah. one of you guys are around. <laughs> I guess I also kind of, had, oh, sorry, I kind of had a vague idea about like the processes mm -hmm. um, coming into Certicos as well. Mm -hmm. um, I fully formed what than what Alex had. Mm -hmm. but, like, I guess the other thing that I was looking at was how in the paper it mentioned that since Certicos is extending CompCert, like CompCert had some assumptions about like infinite stacks and stuff. And I wasn't sure if that would kind of be a similar idea to the finite, non-finite. Um, like 
interfaces because um, it also said right starter costs does have a quota like um, like the paging and uh, it has a limit on that stack and then you have to make sure that they're in stack overflow mm -hmm. issues I was kind of wondering if that was connected <laughs> right um, that's probably I think that probably mostly about the aspect that someone is sort of like their assumption right uh, I think concert um, assumes like an infinite uh, sort of memory uh, which is going to be awkward if you want to reason about the kernel stack <laughs> which is not infinite so they have to do some tricks to patch it up um, but I don't think they need to break anything like there's they, they don't need to break uh, infinite memory into smaller sort of like uh, parts and, and prove that you know the conversation is, is is fine but yeah that's definitely an issue they had to uh, deal with um, yeah, any more comments? Right. Christian, I don't know if you, you had any other thoughts from, on this or not. Or same example we had in mind or different yeah. ones. Yeah, I don't have anything else. I also thought just about this forward uh, sorry, goes, uh, mm -hmm. as uh, bounded memories. memory. Uh -huh. Yeah. So actually, you can imagine uh, uh, to, to, to actually build on, I'm not trying to guess if that's a, a good match. So you can imagine, uh, you know, because Certicons doesn't really have a syscall for actually free memory, uh, like a, you know, keying a process. Uh, but you can imagine if Certicons had a syscall that um, kills a process, uh, that system call has to reclaim uh, all the pages, all the memory the process owns. And that actually would be potentially unbounded, or you know, sure it's bounded to the sorry, uh, it's bounded to the number of processes, but um, it's unbounded uh, in the sense that you don't know how many numbers of the pages the process might have, and the, the kernel might have a, a long-running loop, and that's hard to encode uh, into SMT. Um, another example would be like in, Com uh, in Komodo, if you, you know, Komodo doesn't really have, like if you want to add a uh, monitor call that nukes uh, Enclave just entirely, just in one go, uh, that would be a uh, sort of like unbounded loop, right? Be like a non-finite loop, uh, which also depends on how many you know pages that Enclave owns. Uh, so if you have a system like that, and if you want to reason about properties like that, uh, then it requires you to break it down to smaller things. Uh, or you have to use a different tool, a more powerful tool, such as like Daphne or, or Gawk uh, to do it. Uh, so fortunately, a lot of those kind of low-level systems like security monitors, you know, they are already designed with that in mind. You know, they don't want a non-running loop there. Uh, so that's a good fit here. Uh, but for other systems, for example, uh, if you want to uh, reason about very complex file system behavior. Uh, like, you know, I think the you know, more advanced version of FSQ, uh, the, the FSQ, where the file system can do uh, different writes or with a lot of like a potential uh, states, uh, then oftentimes, you know, how to encode them in a final way is unclear. You know, that would be like either like we require more research into how to do that or maybe it's just not doable there and you need a more powerful tool that's cocked to do it. So it really depends on uh, what kind of systems you have and what properties you want to verify. Okay, um, so in the rest of the lecture, I just want to briefly uh, talk about the uh, another sort of application of Servo we did uh, more recently uh, called Jirbug. And this is a tool we build on top of Servo to verify the just-in-time compilers uh, for BPF in the uh, Linux kernel uh, and how basically we get the automated verification. We say it's a you know, rest restricted form of compiler correctness, how we uh, got it down and got it upstream to the Linux kernel. Uh, so I won't go into the details, uh, the technical details here, um, but I'll just briefly describe the problem and the results and feel free to check the source code. Uh, on GitHub and, and the uh, paper as well. Uh, so the application here, this uh, thing called uh, is called extended, or just sometimes people just ignore, uh, just omit extended, just call it a Berkeley packet filter or BPF. 
Uh, it's basically a, a domain specific language uh, people use for tracing networking security. A lot of things you can do on Linux. Uh, basically, what you do, uh, you know, what you do is as an application developer, you submit a BPF program. You write a program in this BPF language, then you submit the program to the OS kernel, and the OS kernel will insert that program to various hook points in the system, so you can do all kinds of things. Uh, for uh, performance reasons, the kernel will translate the BPF into uh, machine code uh, using a uh, just-in-time compiler or JIT compiler. So here you can see the correctness of the JIT compiler, of course, is very critical because of the code is running in the kernel and also it makes decisions throughout the system. So if anything goes wrong in the compiler, it generates run code, then the BPF code is going to be, uh, be really bad for a system. Uh, so this is roughly what uh, looks like. So the uh, input of the BPF uh, source language is you can imagine it as a risk like a uh, virtual machine. It has a bunch of registers and a bunch of instruction opcodes. Uh, you can do, you know, normally what you do, you can jump you know, like your control flow. You can have, you can call into kernel functions in a, a controlled way. You can share memory with the rest of the kernel and your space as well. Uh, when your uh, application submits a BPF program to the kernel, the kernel first runs something called the uh, um, called BPF verifier. So we, we just call it BPF checker to, to avoid the confusion. Um, but uh, basically what it does is the kernel will stackingly basically you know, inspects the program and makes sure it doesn't have, it doesn't do arbitrary things. Like for example, it doesn't have out of bounds memory access, doesn't have division by zero, uh, it will terminate uh, within some bounds uh, and will reject programs that violate that. And after that, the, the chip compiler will kick in and uh, will basically take that source program and directly generate uh, machine code. So it's like a compiler plus assembler plus linker at the same time. And the kernel will now just attach it to uh, different points. Uh, in the kernel. Uh, so, you know, the JIT compiler, you know, looks simple, but, you know, it's a compiler, it's actually not easy to get it right. Uh, we actually looked at um, um, the sort of Git history, the log of, of that part, you know, from 2014, and that's when the, uh, the, the current uh, BPF design was introduced until uh, this year. Uh, there were, you know, like, you know, dozens of uh, correctness bugs, and they are, Quite serious um, because you know you, once you can get the wrong BPF, you can just in, try to inject uh, those kind of uh, wrong programs into your kernel, uh, and it happens on all different like all kinds of like instruction when you, you compile all kinds of instructions that you compile might go wrong. It could be like you know some jump instructions or arithmetic instructions, uh, and. It's hard to get that right, or uh, because you know the chip compiler has to consider a lot of state. Uh, for example, uh, you have to consider the configuration of your compiler, you know, whether to in enable certain optimizations or not. Uh, you have to consider the control flow of the JIT and the emitted code. So that's a, a bit different uh, from like a verifying. So when you are verifying as a, a security monitor, the code is given, right? It's static. You just verify that code. Your input is symbolic, but your your, your code is, is static. Uh, but when you, when you try to verify a, a JIT, uh, the JIT is emitting code, and then you can emit different you know, kinds of code, uh, and then you have to read about every single one of them and the control flows in the emit code as well. Uh, and given the sort of like complexity of the semantics, so it's hard to do that. Uh, for human actually to keep track of all possibilities, are also hard for verification tools as well. Um, and then, of, of course, you also have to know all the precise model of all the you know, weird corners of um, uh, instruction semantics. Uh, so this is you know, really hard to, to audit and also to test. Uh, the, the news kernel has a very large uh, comprehensive uh, test suite, uh, but still you know, we'll miss um, some bugs in some corner cases here and there. Uh, so the work, the Jitterbug work uh, we did recently is really like how do you extend the kind of uh, automated verification uh, to those uh, JIT compilers? 
to do that, I think you know as you mentioned, you will face the problem uh, as you will see in Nikolai's lecture about concert. Um, the uh, compiler correctness um, spec uh, in general is talking about you know, about the number uh, about the number of events in traces, and that trace is not a finite trace. So in order to to reason about that, you need a better spec that talks about only a, a small part of like you know the steps in your compiler, so you can encode it uh, in uh, SMT. So what we do actually is in two steps. First is we uh, develop a meta theory. Uh, we use the Lean Theorem Prover, which is a, you know, very similar to, to COC you, you guys have been using for our labs. Uh, and also based on that, we, we develop a meta theory to break that uh, compiler correctness theorem into a, a series of smaller steps that can be encoded um, in uh, SMT. Uh, and you know we have a bunch of tricks to how to you know basically to scale uh, verification for to reason about those kind of like symbolic code because now the JIT is emitting code that is also symbolic uh, by using the symbolic profiling and the optimization uh, I uh, described in, uh, earlier in this lecture. Uh, so I won't go into the details here, but here's a, a sort of like the, the summary of the, the results. Uh, we uh, wrote a new PPF JIT compiler for 32-bit risk 5 uh, and we actually verified it. And we even actually played some tricks. We developed some optimizations using program synthesis because you now the result has a building support for that. Uh, and then the entire thing is written in a, a domain-specific language we, uh, we designed, uh, but we were able to extract C code uh, and we uh, submitted to the news kernel and now it's being shipped with the news kernel since like March uh, this year. Um, and so that's for developing a new JIT compiler. Uh, we also verified the existing ones. So we ported uh, the existing ones to uh, from the C code, manually translated them to from C to the DSL we uh, developed. Uh, and you know, for verification, we have the same spec. You need to write more environments. We basically uh, copying them over from for the risk five jet to the uh, for the x6 and other architectures um, and it took basically you know like a few weeks per jet for one uh, person so uh, it, it's fairly like low overhead uh, when you do that so in the process we found a bunch of new bugs and all, uh, so we wrote bug fixes and patched to the uh, uh, kernel developers and they have all been uh, fixed right now uh, so the uh, and also we will found like two bugs in the sort of core library, I think the uh, ARM, uh, which is used by other uh, kernel components as well. Uh, so the cool part of this is actually um, you know the, the code is well tested, right? This is a very comprehensive uh, test suite. Uh, so finding bugs in well tested code is actually a cool thing. And it shows you how verification you know helps you sort of like really you know narrow down to look at every corner case uh, in details. Uh, another interesting sort of like side effect uh, of like doing verification is, uh, you know, the JIT compiler sometimes doesn't do you know, uh, too many optimizations because it's hard to think them carefully when you have like complex uh, optimizations. So, you know, now we have verification. So it's like, you know, <laughs> you have this more better you know, per, uh, confidence uh, in your code. So we actually develop a bunch of uh, optimizations and, and uh, and we submitted them to the kernel and now they are part of the uh, uh, news kernel as well. So um, that say sort of all for uh, today. Uh, so I, basically this is a sort of like, hopefully you can see this is a sort of like a verification stack that's uh, different from you have seen in previous lectures, uh, really like uh, focuses on proof automation and what kind of systems you can build uh, using that. Uh, and the cool thing is, if you, know, if you remove the proof burden and you can find the right kind of systems that are amenable to those kind of verification, uh, it's uh, nice to get that uh, into practical systems like the news kernel and you can get your verified code uh, there for other people to use. Uh, so this is what um, roughly the kind of things we, we do uh, in, in our group at U Washington. So just some you know advertisement, <laughs> if you, interested in doing those kind of like you know verification from method and system building uh, and you want to get uh, your coding to you know, practical systems and you are considering grad school uh, 
you might consider applying to us. So thanks, and I'll stay here uh, for a few minutes and feel free to ask uh, questions. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chief, for a nice lecture. Yeah. Thanks <laughs> for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.